was a morning early in this winter, very gray overhead and cold enough. I went up to Dykeman Street, which is a mile or so along Riverside Drive, after you have passed the George Washington Bridge. From the broad stretch of Dykeman Street, the earth lifts suddenly, and you look up from the asphalt toward a high line of trees, almost bare of leaves. That is Inwood Hill, where the city is pottering away with a few hundred men out of the ranks of the unemployed, hoping to make a park out of the northern tip of Manhattan Island. It is no sure thing that the city will succeed, because this Inwood Hill has always been a queer sort of place, a lugubrious sort of place, heavy with irrational legends that tell the ultimate defeat of everybody who ever went there. Everywhere are brooding, fragmentary monuments to catalog the failures, the failure of the poor, savage Lenape Indians, of the Bolton brothers with their fine schemes, of the millionaire suburbanites, of wailing lost women, and even, alas, of those intrepid souls, the Murphys and the Honeyman. But if you would glance at these relics of small, forgotten tragedies, you must know the geography. They call it Inwood Hill, but it really has two summits. And as I stood in the little saddle between them, looking toward the north, the green hill was at my right and Cock Hill at my left. The green hill, once a farmer laid down fields of grain there and gave it its name, slopes off gently to the Harlem River on the east. The very foot of the hill stands upon the banks of Spite and Dival Creek. Although there is no longer a creek at all, they dredged it out to make the ship canal. But they did not bother to dam up the spring, which Henry Hudson, in a waggish mood one morning, called the Spitting Devil. A little way from the spring, there towers an immense tulip tree, nearly 300 years old, and the most ancient living thing in all Manhattan. Cock Hill looks out over the Hudson River. It is a little taller than the other, and covered with poplar, sycamore, and tulip trees. Between the two heights, there is a precipitous cleft, deep, forbidding, and full of shadowed gloom. This was named the Clove, and it was in the dark cradle of the Clove that human life first began on Manhattan. Nowadays, you may peer into smoke-blackened caves where the poor Lenape Indians lived, where they crouched in terror of the Mohawks, hoping that they were hidden well. You may peer, also, into glacial potholes. Fashioned by some incredible corkscrew action eons ago. Out of these deep, smooth wells have been dug the mean history of the Lenape. Their poor tools, the skeletons of their dead, still pierced by the Mohawk arrows. And if you are a detective story fan, you may remember that in Mr. Van Dyne's latest, the dragon murder case, the mangled bodies of the victims were found in these same potholes, Inwood being the mise-en-scene of the thriller. After the Indians were driven out, Inwood Hill, all of its 166 acres, was allotted to the Dykemans and the Nagels. But they never cared enough about the land to build a house there. Indeed, the only building at all, until 1860, was the little fort built by the Revolutionary Army when the British were campaigning along the Hudson. I went to see where it stood, on the top of Cock Hill, and still could make out its outlines, a few mounds of earth. I walked along the Bolton Road, which winds and curls upward through the clove toward the heights. It was a silent way, full of an odd melancholy. I met only a few people strolling there, some uneasiness, some hushed quality in the atmosphere made them stop their low talk with each other as they approached me, made them tramp by silently, eyes on the ground, and resumed their conversation only after they had passed well on. 
There were no birds, no little rustling in the dried leaves beneath the trees. Curtis and John Bolton made that torturous road. In 1817, they left their shipyard in Savannah and bought in wood and laid it out in building lots. But their efforts to make people buy the lots and build houses on them met with complete failure. And after a few years, they traded the land for upstate property and went away. Their road, the Bolton Road, under the beat of storms and the weight of ice, crumbled away and receded once again into the earth until it was almost indistinguishable. Then Samuel Thompson built his house and repaired the road. It was, if you judge by the fragments of its foundation still left, a big house, nobly proportioned. In time, the Thompson house passed to the builder's son-in-law, James McCreary, the merchant, and he was rich enough, powerful enough, socially, to bring neighbors to Inwood. There was a rush of building, and soon mansions dotted the double hill, the homes of Isidore Strauss, the genius of Macy's, of Joseph Kepler, art editor of Puck, of Cornelius Kalin, Walter Burns, Colonel Frederick Dent Grant, the Green and MacDonald families. They were prim Victorian villas, for the most part. They are gone now, but a few stones remain to tell where they were. But even with enough people on the hill to make a gay society, even with the laughter and music which grew in mannered drawing rooms, the curiously sad quality of the place could not be exercised. The winds from the Hudson screamed through the trees in the winter, and in summer the road was often a quagmire, impassable for the horse-drawn carriages, which must make the steep ascent. But worst of all, certain establishments of a fixed unhappiness came to perch upon the hill. In 1895, the sisters of the Convent of St. Mary of the Protestant Episcopal Church built a huge brick prison the House of Mercy, on the brow of Cock Hill. Two hundred rooms in a chapel, dedicated to the reclamation of wayward girls. The Green and MacDonald mansions were sold, joined together, and became a house of rest for consumptives. The Magdalen Benevolent Society built a gray citadel overlooking Dykeman Street. As swiftly as Inwood had come into fashion, so now it went out of fashion. The wailing of the girls at the House of Mercy was a disheartening sound. The constant dropping of the flag to half-mast at the House of Rest was a dismal thing to see. People who owned homes in Inwood came to them as rarely as possible, preferring their town establishments. And then Isidore Strauss went down on the Titanic. The Grant House caught fire and burned. Soon, there was a concerted abandonment of the whole colony. The villas were boarded up to gather cobwebs and ghostly legends. Inwood Hill was given over to the institutions for the weak and the dying. I went through the gray trees, past the heaps of rubble, the half-buried angles of masonry, which told where the villas once had stood. Everything, or nearly everything, has been torn down in the last three years. By desultory piecemeal purchases, the city acquired Inwood between 1916 and 1925. But nobody got to work on the hill until 1930, when it turned out to be as good a place as any to use a few squads of unemployed. Not many of them were working that morning. Now and again, I could hear their voices in some far corner of the park, the thump of mattocks as they swung on the tangled lilac bushes or tore out festoons of wild grape. But I could not see them, and it was a lonely place. Just over the brow of Cock Hill, I saw a pair of rusted iron gateposts, a rough road leading between them. Following the road, I came upon the ruin of a vast building. The inner wall of a chapel stood blankly to the sky. 
and on most of the windows, old frames of iron grill work still hung. In a little cleared space, between uneven piles of ancient brick, a young Italian laborer crouched over a bit of fire, munching a thick sandwich, a bunch of white grapes dangling from his hand. I said, was this the house of mercy? He shook his head. Don't know, he said, but I think she a bad house. Anyhow, she come down now. He laughed at the towering wrecked walls, the tumbling doorways. I picked my way toward one such doorway. Above it, a row of windows had the grillwork still intact, and it was somehow monstrously ironic to observe the gugas in that grillwork, the rosettes and the curling scrolls, the faint-hearted attempt to pretend that the iron was something other than a simple bar to freedom. For the unhappy wenches who found their way into this house of mercy were prisoners no less. I went through the dark, cluttered halls and found the old laundry room with its slate walls. On the slate walls, dimly visible in that light, were messages of despair from forgotten souls who once had wept above the suds. I could make out a few. I wish I was dead. God, help me get out of here. I was put in the house of mercy for nothing. I saw the little cells where they had lived, and I saw the vestiges of the chapel where their sterner and more righteous sisters had ordered them to repent. Yet, it is the fabulous truth that the one merry tale of all in wood, the one fine and warming episode, worked itself out between these same depressing walls. I speak of the Murphys. Seven years ago, the House of Mercy people decided that they too had had enough of Inwood Hill. They moved away to Valhalla and sold their property to the city. Mr. Murphy applied for the job of caretaker and got it. Thereupon, with Mrs. Murphy and ten small Murphys, he moved out of his five-room tenement flat on the east side and into the two hundred reverberating rooms of the castle on the heights. No ten children that ever lived had such a time as the Murphys. There was air and sunshine and Indian caves, almost limitless space in which to play. Fine and terrifying ghosts always on tap. The long galleries of the prison made perfect roller skating. And in the winter, when the pipes froze and burst, a smooth, glassy surface covered the floors of the largest rooms, giving them a perfect indoor rink for ice skating. For seven years, there was never a lack of sport, for each new exploration of the vast building suggested a new game, and there were delightful neighbors. Three or four hundred yards away, on the northern slope of the hill, Mr. Michael Feslian had his farm. He had myriads of bees that made honey for him, and he could always get a Murphy or two to help. Down at the bottom of the clove, on the banks of the canal, the houseboat colony was a grand place to visit. There wasn't much money in the houseboat colony, but the people were merry and lived in little floating homes that seemed marvelously snug and adventurous after the great reaches of the empty castle. In several of the abandoned gardens of the abandoned villas, nice fellows had built little shacks where visitors were always welcome. The beginning of the end of the Murphy Paradise, after the seven golden years were almost done, came when the authorities drove out the squatters, or shack people, as the Murphy children called them. Then the houseboat colony was dispersed. Then, alas and alack, the men came to tear down the castle itself. That, of course, did not drive the Murphys out at once. They just lived on. Even after the sweet pea bed had been trampled down and the great lilac bush they loved so well had been cut away, as long as there was a bit of roof 
one room left so that a man could have a bit of privacy, they delayed their departure. And then, finally, the house was caving in about them, and they had to go. I shall always think of it as a tragic spectacle. That day when Mr. and Mrs. Murphy and the ten children, hampered with precious little baggage, trooped out of the falling gateway for the last time and went slowly down the hill back into the city from which they had escaped so miraculously. Mr. Fesslian was not driven out by the wrecker's hand. He was simply told to go. His villa was still intact, a pathetic reminder of one of the last and surely the smallest farms in Manhattan. He had three miniature buildings, one of them patched together from glass exclusively, bits of old pain that he had gathered in his travels. It made a cozy summer house with its superb view of the Hudson. His minuscule garden, six rows, each 10 feet long, was enough to provide his own fresh vegetables. He had an ornamental fence about it, grills that he had removed from the windows of the prison. But his chief occupation was the bees. It is a little sad now to see the sign which still stands, pure white clover honey for sale and then to glance at the tumbled rank of the hives, roofs caved in, the sides broken, which once were such industrious homes, the subject of such loving care. But Mr. Fesslian remains in spirit to watch over his unpretentious homestead. The doors of the three tiny houses are carefully locked. On one of them is a small framed portrait of the farmer, safe behind the protective glass. It was cut from some rotogravure page and shows a smiling, generous face with a proud legend underneath, celebrating the city's last practical agriculturalist. Down near the spring, at the opening of the clove, the Kennedys still survive, the last inhabitants of Inwood. Mrs. Kennedy is the official curator of the little museum of Indian relics founded by Reginald Pelham Bolton, descendant of the Savannah Boltons and secretary of the Dykeman Institute. Mrs. Kennedy is an Indian and prefers to call herself the Princess Naomi. She is very tall and thin. Two gold teeth are quite her prize. She is of Cherokee blood convent educated, and her family is enormous. They all live in the tiny room or two above the tiny museum. Children, grandchildren, sisters, cousins, and aunts. One son is a prize fighter, but his earnings are not quite enough, and so the family sells popcorn and candy, soda pop, and ice cream. They do not live the pastoral life that their quiet retreat would suggest. For generally, their cottage is a storm of noise, phonograph going steadily, quarrels mounting and subsiding, occasional laughter, almost constant crying of children. Among the objects in their charge is a concrete replica of an aboriginal Indian dwelling, but they decided long ago that this might serve a more useful purpose than merely being stared at by the curious. They use it for a chicken house. Also, on the appropriate days, they hang the family wash upon its beams to dry. Once a year, on Indian Day, the Kennedys have an open house, and the result is a great deal of company indeed. All the Indians who happen to be in New York drop around, South American and Mexican Indians, Yaqui and Pueblo folk, as well as the tribes to which the Kennedys are more directly related. All the guests, led by the Kennedys, climb the steep embankment to the secluded corner which has been built for them. Their program, then, includes various ceremonials, dances and rituals appropriate to whatever tribes may be represented on the occasion. And it is their ardent wish to be alone, but they are generally surrounded by curious pale faces 
who admire the costumes, applaud the speeches, and buy rounds of soda pop for Mrs. Kennedy. I came away, up the clove, followed a new cinder path of the sort that will mark the difference between public park and queer, small wilderness, and stood again on the green hill. After the intense activities of the Kennedy menage, the hill seemed more silent, more lonely than ever. It was more than that. It was touched with a pervading, inescapable sadness. Somehow, I had the notion that hordes of romping folk, piles of abandoned newspapers, and the remains of evil lunches will not change the sadness very much. They will only mar its almost enchanting purity. Morris Markey, 1933